Hi everyone. Before we get started on these stories, I just wanted to mention that this is one of the darkest videos I've ever done. Now, I've done a lot of dark stories, but seriously, these are very, very dark. The first story mentions a racial hate crime, and then the rest of the stories either mention very dark abuse or straight up murder. So yeah, these are awful. And if you're not able to stomach stories like that, please go ahead and click off. Seriously. If you're all ready, let's go ahead and get started. The story was told to me by my uncle, and I figured I'd share it. Now, just a fair warning, the story is really dark. This happened when my uncle was about 12 years old back in 1980 in Ottawa Lake, Michigan. Him, my dad, and aunt were all little kids at the time and had been living in the house my grandfather had built about five years prior. The house was a single-story ranch and sat on an acre of land next to a really large stretch of woods. It was a warm summer evening at about 10 p.m., and my uncle and my dad were in their bedroom with the windows open since it was so warm outside. Suddenly, they were awoken by the sound of distant screaming coming from the woods. My uncle and my dad shot up from their beds and then ran to go tell my grandfather. He got up and my grandmother and my aunt and uncle and dad all followed him outside to the front porch. He used a flashlight and he shined it towards the woods, but it was really dark and he couldn't really see anything. That is, except for a very faint orange glow deep into the distance. He went back inside and used the phone in the kitchen and he had called some of his buddies to come over. And like a scene right out of a horror movie, 18 minutes later, two pickup trucks full of guys with shotguns then arrived. My grandfather made my grandmother, my uncle, dad, and aunt and uncle wait inside the house while they went into the woods to investigate. My uncle said they were gone for a really long time, and my grandmother had started worrying. At about 1 a.m., the guys finally returned, but they were all really pale and wouldn't really say much about what they saw. When my grandmother had asked about what happened, my grandfather had made the kids go back to bed and then took her to the garage on the other side of the house to talk to her. He didn't tell my uncle what happened until years later, and it's no wonder that he didn't tell my grandmother in front of them. Well, when they went into the woods, after walking deeply into it, they found an abandoned campsite with a smoldering fire, beer cans everywhere, and a moonshine still and on a nearby tree was the horrifying sight of a naked black man beaten and hung in a noose with a KKK flag stitched to his chest. There's more, but I'm gonna leave it out because it's truly graphic. My grandfather said that it was the most horrifying thing he'd ever seen. They then immediately turned around and left. He went back in daylight a few days later, but the body had been buried with another KKK flag being used as the marker. Now, you're probably hoping some sick people were arrested and that justice was brought to the family of this person, but unfortunately, no. My grandfather never called the sheriff. Unfortunately, the Monroe County sheriffs are extremely corrupt, and some of them are even KKK members themselves, and some still are to this day, and even the sheriff is part of a well-known biker gang. So, no report was ever made because it probably would have gotten thrown out and probably would have put a huge target on the back of my grandfather as well as his buddies. You won't find this story online because it was never reported, and a lot of people probably don't want this out there, but I just had to share it so there's some record of it. Just please don't go investigating this. It might still really piss off some people in those parts, but if you ask any locals that live there for a really long time, They'll tell you that Woods was a well-known hangout for the KKK back in that day. I'm just really glad that that time is now over. This happened to me when I was 23. One night I went to a restaurant in the city. I'm not saying which restaurant or which city for privacy, but it was a restaurant that had a bar in it. On this particular night, I had ordered my food and soda. I didn't order any alcoholic beverages. I was going to drive myself home afterwards. Anyway, after my food arrived, just as I was about to start eating, there was an older guy one table over, 
and he was just staring at me. Then he smiled and looked away. I didn't think too much of it and just started eating my food. When I had ate about half of my food and finished some of my drink, I had excused myself to go to the restroom. After I left the restroom, I went back to my table, and that same guy at the one table over me was staring at me yet again, and he did it for a few seconds longer this time. I was starting to get really creeped out, so I just went back to eating my food. However, when I took a drink of my soda, it had tasted really weird. It didn't taste as it should, but I shrugged it off and drank the rest of it. Then I paid and left. When I got to my car, my stomach immediately started feeling funny. It wasn't hurting, it was just feeling kind of funny, but I didn't really pay too much attention to it. I just drove myself home. I got home at about 10 p.m. When I got back to my house and went inside, I had started to feel a really sharp pain in my stomach. So I went and sat down on the couch. Then after about a minute, the pain had started to settle. But then five minutes later, it started up again. Only this time it was hurting worse. It seriously hurt so bad that I began crying. I must have ate something bad at the restaurant, but I didn't think it was that at first. Then the pain settled again after about a minute. Then about 15 minutes later, I had started to feel another feeling in my stomach. I went to the bathroom just in case something bad was about to happen. Shortly after, I was right. Then I actually started to feel really sick to my stomach, so I leaned over the toilet and began throwing up. I was puking my guts out, and I was doing it so much that I was throwing up like that possessed girl from The Exorcist. I then got down on my knees and my stomach started really hurting horribly. At first, I thought it was just food poisoning from the food that I ate at the restaurant. But every time I tried getting up, my stomach would still hurt. So I had pulled my phone out of my pants pocket and called 911. I told them what was going on and they then arrived in about five minutes. I told the paramedics everything and how my stomach really hurt when I tried to get up. So they had strapped me on the gurney and took me to the hospital. Once we arrived, I had told the doctor and nurse everything as well. I even told them what time I was at the restaurant and everything else. They said they'd call the restaurant and explain. A little while later, they came back and they were explaining that I was throwing up not because of food poisoning, but that someone had spiked my drink. They told me that apparently the restaurant manager had looked at the security cameras and he had saw a guy spike my drink with something. They also described him to be the exact same guy at the restaurant who was staring at me previously. I was shocked. I never thought something like this would happen to me, but I had spent the whole night in the hospital for observation. The next morning, the police came into my room and told me that the restaurant manager had showed them the camera footage of the guy spiking my drink. They also said they were able to catch the guy, and he was arrested. The police asked if I wanted to press charges, and I told them yes. Later that afternoon, I got to head home. The police were the ones who drove me home. Later that night, the police had called me. It took some time, but he ended up being sentenced for quite a while in jail. That on top of additional charges that he previously had. To the guy who tried to kill me by spiking my drink, fuck you, and I really hope you learn your lesson in jail. But yeah, I don't think I'll ever forget that night for as long as I live. I had two friends, a couple. The guy was really kind and funny. Well, except to her. I really enjoyed being around him when he was calm. He had a rough childhood, didn't have any family and couch surfed even in high school. He was in and out of jail, but they had dated for years and had children. He was extremely abusive to her and everyone in the friend group that I knew. It was sort of normalized because most of the men were all abusive to their girlfriends, mine included. He had went to jail for a time period and she had actually moved on and seemed to be happy. Then he got out. They had seemed to get back together, but she was making it pretty obvious that she was over it and had started standing up for herself. She had enjoyed the freedom and happiness she had when he was in jail and she wanted away from him. 
he didn't take this well. She was basically all he had and he refused to let her go. One morning I got a phone call that he had killed her and then spent hours in their home before he finally killed himself. Shortly after that, my boyfriend and I were fighting and he literally said to me, you know, I'm gonna end up doing to you what he did to her. And I left that very night after six years of severe physical abuse. I like to think that she's part of the reason that I had the strength to leave and never look back. There were warning signs, but no one thought he'd ever take it that far. I now feel so ashamed that I didn't take action or at least help her before it got that far. I knew this guy from living on the bottom floor with his girlfriend in the apartment building that I lived at too. He was very friendly and very polite. He worked every day and he would get dropped off right in front of the building and talk and made everyone laugh. One thing I noticed was that his girlfriend hardly ever talked or spoke to anyone. One day I introduced myself and she was nervously watching for her boyfriend to pull up from work. That's my guess anyways. She and I began talking a little bit more often, but she was very careful about the times that she would talk to me. I had also seen a couple of bruises on her face and hands. She was such a fragile, beautiful woman that was depressed and absolutely abused by her boyfriend. Anyways, her boyfriend was a class clown, so to speak to everyone else, but I could see through him by now, so I just kept my distance. One evening, he was drinking outside with the other neighbors. I had to go check my mail. It was getting late, so a little before dark, I had done this. I had left my door unlocked because I was just really young and naive. This was also my first apartment at just 18. I got back from checking my mail, and everyone had gone inside. I went into my apartment, took a shower, and got ready for bed, and then got in bed. Ten minutes later, I had heard a man snoring. It was coming from my bedroom closet. Immediately, I freaked out and then ran out to get another neighbor to take a look inside my closet to find out who it was. Well, that same guy was passed out from drinking. I was hysterical, terrified. The neighbor got him up and then took him to his home to his girlfriend. Well, three years later, she had apparently left him because he was violently abusing her. She went to go live with her parents. Well, he had found her, killed both of her parents and her grandmother, I believe. And he had beat up the girlfriend so badly that she was paralyzed and in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. She had to witness him murdering her parents and grandmother. It was years later when I had found out about this. It's so devastating and so sad. I often wondered if he was going to assault me too. I can't even imagine what she had went through losing her loved ones to that monster. Everyone liked him. Hell, I did too. He seemed really funny and nice, but meeting his girlfriend really changed my mind about him real quick. Years ago, I had a coworker who I got to know in an acquaintance sort of way. She was married and I had met her husband several times. He was nice looking. He was older than her and he was very friendly. One day on her lunch break, she had told me that she was going to pick up some pictures from a local pharmacy. This was in the 90s. The pics were from a recent cruise. When she had returned from lunch, she was very upset because apparently the pharmacy had refused to print the pictures. She said it was because they were naked pictures of both her and her husband. She then revealed some very personal stuff about the two of them that seemed to suggest that the husband was sexual in a way that I'd never even heard of. I was really young at the time, so I had chalked the weirdness up to me being inexperienced. She also told me that her sister had been raped and murdered several years prior. She said that her family had thought that her husband committed the crime because the sister had two children. One was a baby and the older child had been knocked out but was able to remember the killer had hit his face, suggesting it was someone the child knew. Well, my coworker was a staunch supporter of the husband and said the family just didn't like her husband. I believed her. Well, several years later, the husband was arrested, charged, and convicted of rape and murder of the sister. 
DNA testing was actually advanced enough to test some of the evidence at the scene. This case was also actually a Forensic Files episode. Long story short, the husband died in prison of cancer. Apparently my coworker had still supported him even after his conviction. I was young, 18 years old and working my first ever job that I still work to this day. I was assigned to the night shift in a not so great area in a relatively nice city on the west coast. The night was pretty much like any other until I was walking back inside my work building and I was approached by a man who was mumbling things under his breath and had both of his hands in his coat pockets. I tell him to maintain a safe distance from me as I then lightly push on his chest and step back. He takes a step forward and mumbles a few more things under his breath. I attempt to step back and I ask him to please back away from my person, but he just continues to step closer and closer to me. Before I knew what to do next, he had then pulled a very dirty looking kitchen knife out of his right pocket and then held it to the left side of my neck. I put my hands halfway up so that he could see them and I tried to tell him to just please calm down and run off. I even said that I wouldn't contact the police if he were to just leave and never come back. He becomes enraged and starts mumbling a few more things that I still to this day can't make out. I can feel the knife being pressed harder into my neck and his eyes start opening wider and wider and I then realize that I need to act fast or else I might be the victim in this situation. The second I noticed that he didn't have his eyes directly on me, I very slightly but quickly moved my head to the right and pulled it as far back as I could while still trying to maintain my stance. With my right hand I grabbed his knife hand and I tried to get the strongest grip over it I could. With my left hand I cupped his elbow and then pushed my chest and arms towards the direction of his body, trying to push as much of my body weight as I could into the sky. While doing this, I had pushed the knife too close into the direction of his body, and well, the knife stuck into the center of his neck, causing him to drop to the ground almost immediately. While he was on the ground, I then ran inside to dial 911 to get both the police as well as paramedics on the scene as quickly as possible to try and save this guy's life. Unfortunately, the guy had died by the time I ran back outside to be with this guy before paramedics arrived on scene. The police show up and then instantly put me in cuffs and search my person. I was put into the back of the squad car and told to stay quiet until asked to give my side of the story. I had sat in the back of the car for around an hour as I had waited for my boss to show up. She shows up and shows the officers the cameras. I was released out of custody and gave my story to the detectives. Turns out the guy was high on meth and just wandering around the streets with a random knife in his pocket. I really thank the martial arts classes that I had loosely taken in my late teens as well as my ability to let adrenaline kick in and just do its job. I still think about it every day and I oddly feel bad about the whole thing. I know that taking another man's life was just unavoidable in that situation but I sometimes get really angry with myself that I just wasn't able to calm him down a bit more with my words. On the opposite side of the aftermath though, I feel exactly the same as I did day to day before I ever killed that man. I worked in retail in a super shady area of a small town for five years. There's been some documentaries on crime in the region my husband still works there, so it feels like I do too, knowing all the same folks that I used to deal with still come in. Several of my regulars were either murdered or became murderers, almost all drug-related. We sold cell phones. We had a lot of people coming straight out of the doors of prison, and one of their first stops was getting a new phone. These guys were almost always nice. I can't remember personally having a bad customer service experience in those situations, but I mean, I'd probably be in a damn good mood if I just got out of prison too. Anyway, my first experience with a customer in this situation was a guy in his 50s. He seemed very clueless about phones, which wasn't terribly surprising for that age range. At some point, he tells me it's because he just got out after spending 20 years in prison for a string of armed robberies. 
He then tells me to Google him. He seemed very proud of his crimes. One day he comes in and he had actually asked me how to watch porn on his phone. I think I must have just stared at him because he then immediately goes, Never mind, I'll just get my niece to help me. <sighs> okay, man, bye, I said. All jokes aside, he was always so clearly struggling to adjust. He constantly seemed stressed and vented about stuff whenever he came in to pay his bill. And then one day, he decides to break into a home, tie a couple up, and beat the absolute shit out of them, rob their house, all while their kid was in the other room. Thankfully, they survived, but I'm not so sure he intended for them to. Who fucking knows? This guy always stood out to me as a prime example of a ticking time bomb. I think it very easily could have been murder that he did instead of robbing. He needed so much help, and it couldn't have been more obvious. It was to me at least, a fucking salesperson who saw him maybe a couple of times a month. After 20 years separated from society, it was just way too much to come back to, and I always thought that he just desperately wanted to get back to the routine that he did understand. I don't know though. Most of the murderers I knew were from shooting people over drugs, significantly less thought-provoking than the aforementioned customer, I think anyways. One of them shot a man right outside a bar over a woman. Another one shot a bar up over drug money. Another one was a father who murdered his own son over drugs. A man I knew went from looking like a regular member of society to tweaking and sweating every second he's in the store to fucking dead in a bathtub in less than a year. His mother was a customer too, and she had came in to talk to me about his death. She swears that it was a murder committed by his girlfriend even though it was ruled an overdose. She says that he had marks on his wrists like he had been tied up. He used to SIM swap constantly, which you only do when you're scamming someone out of the SIM card with functional service that you had just sold them. I only bring that up as a possible motive for murder. He was a good guy making very bad decisions. This was one of the heaviest on my mind especially since we got on a first name basis with each other before he went downhill so very fast.